Welcome to our Design for Non-Designers class. The word design often calls up images of colors and icons, but it is much more. And we believe everyone involved in creating applications has a role in design. Hi, I'm Andrea Anderson, and I'll be your guide through our Design for Non-Designers course. Our teaching team is very pleased to meet you virtually, and we hope you'll enjoy the course. I've been practicing teaching and coaching design thinking for over 10 years and have been leading engineering teams in creating delightful, useful, and usable applications. Let's talk a little bit about what this course is all about. But before we go there, let me explain the connection between design thinking and design. Design thinking is an approach to problem solving by considering human needs, basically empathy for the end user, feasibility, can something be built at a reasonable cost? And viability, can a certain profit or benefit be drawn from the solution? Design is a core competency required along the design thinking journey. Let me start by introducing the teaching team. First of all, you'll meet Sam Yen. Sam is chief design officer at SAP. And prior to taking on his current role, Sam led the SAP App House, an innovation team tasked with building new solutions establishing new markets, and reaching new users for SAP. You will also meet and hear from Scott Klemmer. Scott is currently Associated Professor in Cognitive Science and Computer Science and Engineering at UC San Diego. He's also co-founder and Associated Co-Director at the Design Lab at UC San Diego. Also in the course, you will meet Goran. Goran is a Principal UX Designer at SAP and acts as the in-go between development and design. He has been working in the digital design industry for well over a decade. He will share some stories about interacting with development teams. And lastly, as I mentioned, I'm Andrea Anderson. I work in the SAP Global Design Team, and I'm an expert in design thinking in a software context. I've been practicing design thinking for more than 10 years and teaching design thinking to product teams but also applied their approach to solutions, product, strategy, and services myself. So, what will you learn during this course? You will be introduced to various aspects of design and gain a basic understanding what you can do yourself to improve the quality of user experience. In this course, you will get an understanding of the relevance of design to the development of quality products. You will also learn how to extend the current understanding of product quality to include delighting end users. You will understand the role of designers, developers, development architects, product managers, and business experts in the design process. You will become familiar with the skills and resources needed to design and build quality user experiences. You will also deepen your knowledge of design and what the work of designers is actually in the development process and get a feel around how good design can become part of a development team's everyday work. Hello again. Next, I will briefly go over some key design terms. Before we go into more detail about design, let me clarify some general terminology. I'm not a designer, and when I first managed product teams that had design teams, it dawned on me that I was not clear around some of the terminology they used. So here's my Reader's Digest version of key design terms you might hear, not only in this course, but throughout your work with designers. Not directly related to design, but absolutely vital to design are personas, storyboards, and use cases. We won't go into much detail around any of these in this class, but keep in mind that these are vital prerequisites for any design work. Personas describe who the solution is for and what their needs and motivations are. Storyboards describe the user journey in context of performing a task and illustrate what potential software solutions might help the persona. Use cases describe a very specific task and the steps the user will take to reach the goal of this task. I like to think about the design process in two main phases. One is conceptual design, and the second one is what I call production design. With solution specifications becoming more and more concrete in each phase, 
We will go into more details of some of these terms in a minute. The conceptual design phase consists of wireframes, floor plans, early interaction flows, and typically the solution architecture. In the production design phase, we talk about interaction design, visual design, and user interaction gets developed, data and functional design happens. Let's talk about wireframes some more. Wireframes outline what is on the page. They depict the layout, the interface elements, the navigation, and how they all work together. Here are some examples. Wireframes can be hand-drawn sketches or more high-fidelity mockups. Interaction design describes the application behavior in response to user interactions. Interaction design happens later in the process, when the wireframes have been tested and iterated. Interaction design specifies the details where UI elements or user experience elements are located, what they're called, and how the user interacts with the application. Individually designed screens are then tied together in an overall interaction flow, describing the flow of user interfaces. Visual design conveys the mood of the application and will have a direct impact on how the user feels about your product. It describes the icons, colors, fonts, and images to be used. Visual design often also includes the elements of a corporate brand, such as icons or colors. Let me start by saying that no one wants to use tools, no matter how good or well designed these tools are. And let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean. When you think about making a dinner, the first thought that comes to mind is probably not, oh great, I get to use the knife. The thought that comes to your mind probably is, I need to chop up some vegetables. When you think about having a tea, are you really excited that you get to use a teapot or a kettle? or is it the prospect of having a nice cup of tea? The case is the same when you need clean clothes. Most people would not get too excited about using a washing machine. What you really need is clean clothes. The washing machine is just a tool to fulfill your need. And in other words, people are result focused. A washing machine might actually not even be your preferred method of reaching this result. So for a user, when an idea for something or a need occurs, they will look for a tool or interface to reach the wanted result. And is the result at the end of the day what's important and not the tool itself or the interface. We should be very conscious of this, as too often as we design software and develop software, we get stuck at focusing on the tool itself rather than on what the user really wants, which is the result. The other concept to keep in mind is that as users want to reach the result, they want to do this with minimal effort from their side. So to give an example, let's talk about social circles in Google+, an experiment that in some ways went completely wrong, as we know. Uh, one of their main features is making their users work. They have this concept of social circles where they ask users to group their contacts in circles or groups. In other words, actually they want you to spend time working on this. Whereas Facebook does this automatically. They group your friends, even if you don't use this feature, which most likely some of you don't, but occasionally you do. And it's nice knowing that Facebook does this automatically for you and you don't have to spend time and work on it. Which is really surprising because Google is absolutely well aware of this principle of not forcing users to do work, but instead getting to the results as soon as possible. When you go to Google, google.com or whatever, your cursor is automatically placed in the search box. You can just start typing and you get to the results page and again, those results load automatically. So in other words, Google is removing as many as possible intermediate steps to get you straight to the results. 
which brings me to my nemesis on the internet, which is the credit card input form. Why do they still ask you to select a credit card type when most of you probably know that you can deduce the credit card type by the first two numbers of the credit card itself? And they also ask you not to enter spaces or dashes and of course then you accidentally enter a space or a dash and then they tell you, oh, error, you entered dashes. I mean, are you kidding me? They actually tell you what you did wrong, which is incredible because they actually know, meaning someone spent coding time to detect your dash and instead of simply removing this dash and processing the number, no, they tell you, there's a dash right there. Come on, just remove it and process the number. Which brings me to the final point. Let us all remember that good design equals removal of all non-value ad work for the user while still having a laser focus on the results. Hi everybody, welcome to the class Design for Non-Designers. Our industry is in the middle of a dramatic shift today. Uh, for so long, the IT industry was all about features and functions. Adjectives like robustness, scalability, performance were, were the important talking points. And now, more than ever, experience, the user experience, is at the core of what um, all of our customers need. You could call it experience innovation in the enterprise. Some people have also called it con the consumerization of IT. Uh, I like to re refer to it as the humanization of IT. There was an article that I read over the summer that talked about um, what they did at Apple with regards to design. Um, this was an ex-Apple designer, and the point that he was trying to make was um, he wanted to demystify some things that uh, people conceived about Apple. Number one, he said, Apple didn't have the most number of designers. Also, he said that Apple didn't necessarily have the best designers. But what he did say is that at Apple, at the core, everybody cared about the user experience, whether it was the designer or the architect uh, or somebody even kind of in involved in packaging. And that kind of value system, those cultures really was pervasive within Apple. I think that thing has to happen for our entire IT industry as well. At SAP, hopefully you've seen that we've done a lot internally uh, to, to really bring that design process, the design culture into what we do. And hopefully you see that that's reflected in some of our new products and solutions. Um, but we feel that, in general, that, that transformation, that journey has to happen for the entire industry. And that's really the purpose of this course. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the class. Good design brings people joy. It helps us do things we care about and helps us to connect to people that we care about. Good user interfaces can have a tremendous impact on both individuals' ability to accomplish things and societies as a whole. Graphical user interfaces have put computing on hundreds of millions of desks, enabling us to do things like do create documents and share photos, interact with family, and find information. Conversely, bad design costs time, money, and lives. Medical devices, airplane accidents, and nuclear disasters are just a few domains where bad user interfaces have caused serious injury, even deaths. What gets me is that many of these interface problems could have been easily avoided. Fixing these problems requires following just some basic principles like consistency and feedback. Growing up, I loved John Denver's music, and in 1998, he passed away tragically uh, while flying his airplane. As is common in situations like this, there were a number of factors in play. Usually deaths mean that multiple different bad things happen simultaneously, one you can usually recover from. In John Denver's case, it was a combination of low fuel, a hard-to-reach handle to switch the gas tanks, and some custom modifications to his plane. So this meant that a bad user interface required John Denver to turn around, and the ergonomics of the cockpit actually contributed to his death. Here's another remarkable example of an emergency telephone 
where you're supposed to dial 999. However, the telephone, physical telephone itself, only has the numbers 1, 2, and 3. And so there's a post-it note at the bottom. We'll get to that later as a key signal of bad design. Explains how to map the buttons available to the number that you need to dial. Crazy. But it's not just the dramatic reasons that good design can be so transformative. We interact with you know, hundreds of websites, apps, ticket kiosks, all sorts of physical, digital, and combined uh, information and user experiences. And let's say that the friction caused by bad design uh, causes Americans 10 minutes of delay uh, each day. Now there are 300 million Americans. So just in America alone, that would be 3 billion person minutes a day, or 18 billion person hours per year. This is an enormous amount of time, and if you think about the problems in the world and the opportunities facing society, we could put this 18 billion person hours to much better use. At its best, good design often becomes invisible. You can think of the metaphor of a blind person walking with a cane. When you first try using a cane, it's pretty awkward, but as you gain expertise, you begin to have your sensory system almost experience sensing at the end of the cane. And so you, you, the cane becomes an interface that you work through rather than something that you attend to directly. Designing great user interfaces requires enormous creativity and a lot of hard work. But designing pretty good user interfaces is actually pretty easy if you know some basic methods, techniques, and principles. And in this course, I'll show you how. Through these next sections, you'll be introduced to some of the most common design ideas to make your interactions more enjoyable, productive, and fun.